Today marks two years living without alcohol and in honor of 730 days without booze, I'm making this video. I asked my followers on social media what they wanted to know about my experience going two years without liquid courage in bars and clubs, celebrating my birthdays without brewskis, and of course, New Year's without the bubbly. But before we dive into that, I wanna make one quick disclaimer. In no way is this video meant to shame or judge people who drink. In fact, I am the last person who should be judging anyone for their drinking habits. So if you're someone who's interested in cutting some of your alcohol consumption down, if you're considering quitting altogether, or if you're just curious for someone else in your life that you may want to share this information with, stick with me because we're going to be going through a lot. I posted on my Instagram and Facebook stories and I just asked, what would you want to know about my experience going without alcohol for two years? And these are the questions that I got. Are you an AA or did you become sober because you wanted to? So the short answer is no. I've never been part of AA. I've never been to a meeting before. I you know, respect the organization. They do a lot of great work for a lot of people. I did quit for a, a whole variety of reasons. And this brings up a, a complicated assumption that when someone in our society stops drinking, it's likely because they're an alcoholic. And I think the question that we struggle with the most is what, what defines an alcoholic and what defines someone with an alcohol problem? Does someone that enjoys a glass of wine every single night with dinner, do they have a problem with alcohol because they drink every single day? Does someone who only drinks once a week but they black out when they drink, do they have an alcohol problem, are they an alcoholic? Or is the term alcoholic only reserved for you know people that you see on the street, living, homeless, with shopping carts, drinking 40 ounces out of a bag? And to be honest, I don't think we really know the answer, but I do think that just because you are not labeled an alcoholic or you don't label yourself an alcoholic doesn't mean that you may not have an issue with alcohol or that you may want to quit. Personally, my issue with alcohol was never a daily dependency. There was never a time in my life where I felt like I needed to drink every day. I was going to withdraw if I didn't drink. I never really considered myself an alcoholic. Where my issues stemmed from was overindulging, drinking too many drinks on a night out. And because I would drink too many drinks in that moment, I would have a hard time saying no to the next one. And then you start making poor choices, doing drugs, eating food late night, getting into fights, saying things that you don't mean, doing things that you shouldn't do. The reality was, at least for me, that those things didn't impact just that night. They impacted me day after day, week after week, month after month, years culminated of bad decisions made that I could primarily track due to my alcohol consumption. And when I really got to asking myself, what is the positive? What are the, what are the benefits that alcohol is bringing to my life? I genuinely had zero answers. It was not bringing anything to my life that my life didn't already have without it. And I wanna go back to the societal perspective because I believe that there's this really big misconception and this program called One Year No Beer hits it on the head. What they say here is you're either an alcoholic or you're not, and therefore you don't have a problem. But what about the gray area in between? Taking a break from booze isn't just for people with an alcohol dependency. Now, I just showed you a, an advertisement from that company, One Year No Beer. I did do One Year No Beer. They have different challenges that range from 30, 60, 90 days. So they send you daily emails with exercises that you can do. They also have an online community for accountability. So for me, that was enough structure and accountability that I wanted, and it actually just started as 30 days without alcohol. It was just a challenge to see if I could go a month, and then beyond that, it turned into 90 days, and then by the time that happened, I, I was not gonna look back. Second question here, how or should drinkers acknowledge someone in recovery? Is it polite or awkward to offer alternatives like water or soda? There's another question here that was kind of similar with someone that I know is going through the process of quitting, what's the best way to support them? So I, I am by no means the spokesman for everybody who's ever quit alcohol and every everyone is an individual. If you wanna be a really good friend, I think it starts with an open conversation, but I think that those conversations need to happen privately. They need to happen one to one and you need to be in a position where you're really allowing that person to open up to you. Take a step back, observe your role in the relationship. Figure out where has your involvement been in the context of their drinking. 
Has your relationship with them been built off of activities that only included drinking? If that's the case, or a lot of them have, what you need to do is figure out what are the new activities that you can incorporate in your friendship that you can do together without alcohol. Instead of going for a beer and inviting someone to a bar, you invite them out for a hike or you invite them to do something that does not include drinking. Lastly, just ask them. Find out what it is exactly that you can do to be a good friend in these situations and what kind of support they need. They may not know, but if you're that person who's offering soda and water to somebody at a party and you know that they don't drink, I think that's awesome. If that someone did that to me, it means that they thought of me, which I would be super grateful for. Another question here was how long before it got easy to pass on drinks? For me, that process wasn't very difficult. The decision to quit kind of happened like a light switch. I had gone so many years actually thinking about quitting that when I finally decided to do it, I was committed to it. And it wasn't gonna matter how many people were gonna offer me drinks. I also took myself out of a lot of environments where maybe I would have been provided drinks or, or someone would have been offering me drinks. But yeah, for me, that, that wasn't an issue at all. What's your vice now, healthy or unhealthy? So I'm gonna start out with the unhealthy because that's a lot more interesting, right? Right. So there's this concept called replacement therapy and when you have something in your life that does take up a considerable portion of mind space or something that you do, you need to replace it with something. For me, that was coffee. So when I quit, I would go to bars and I would order a coffee. And after some time, I noticed that I was actually drinking upwards of five to six, seven cups a day and I was not getting good sleep, I was feeling more anxious and I basically just transferred any unhealthy coping that I used alcohol for onto coffee. And what that turned into was eventually having to quit coffee as well and I realized that I'm much better at abstaining from things than moderating. Basically only drink tea now and that was that was a tough transition to go from coffee to tea. But there's other replacements that I've used. You know, I've had non-alcoholic beers, which, you know, I can go through a six, 12 pack of those in an evening very easily. I don't, I don't drink them that often, but also uh, kava and, and kratom. Now kava and kratom are two supplements one is a root, one is a leaf. They're ground up into tea and they're used as anxiety reducers. I've used those things intermittently because they do give you kind of a head change. In the US, you can find different kava and kratom bars. There's like about a hundred of them in the US. So definitely something to look up. I do sometimes consume cannabis as well, edibles or smoke sometimes. It's usually only on the weekends now, once or twice a week at most. From those substances, they've been uh, pretty controlled, but eating. Food has always been a weakness for me since I've grown up. I grew up overweight. I've been 40 to, to 50 pounds heavier than I am now. On the positive side, and, and some of these can be positive and negative, I guess. Uh, on the positive side's work. I, I work a lot. I work probably 70, 80 hours a week. I work on the weekends. But I noticed that since I quit alcohol, I spent a lot more time on my business. And that was very intentional because I think one of the reasons I did quit is because I noticed how unproductive I would be. When you're building a business and you're trying to scale and you're trying to figure out how you're gonna get customers and, and everything's reliant, you know, the check is reliant on you. You can't just be going out uh, getting drunk all the time. It just doesn't really work. Another healthy one would be exercise. So I exercise a lot. I, I play a lot of basketball. I do boxing, running. Um, here in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, I can run on the beach, which is nice when it's open. I think that that provides me with a huge stress relief and it's something that I can channel, you know, really positive energy into. Okay, so now this was by far the most asked questions were about social life. So I'm gonna read a few of the questions I got about social life and then we'll, we'll kind of go into those. So one of those is, how has it impacted your social life? How do you cope with going out with friends while they're drinking? What's the most difficult challenge being in social situations when others are drinking? What do you do in social settings when people are drinking around you? So that, that one came up a lot. And then verbal response to, to people that are persistently asking you to like take a shot or to drink. I'm gonna start from the top. My social life changed dramatically. But what I realized was I actually really didn't like going to noisy bars and clubs. The only thing at the time that made that tolerable was that sense of escape, was that, that sense of uncertainty and being drunk like that's what made being at a club or a bar fun for me now that I'm not in that headspace I think I've become closer to who I actually am I've, be, I've gotten more 
maybe self-awareness. Just realize like, hey, I don't actually like those things. I don't like being in those noisy environments, the stressful, energy-sucking environments. And I'll still go out every now and again with people, but it's primarily with smaller groups. And I go home a lot earlier. I, you know, I used to stay out until 3, 4, 5 a.m. You will not see me at a bar, usually past midnight at this point. I try to get to bed pretty much every night around uh, 11, 11.30 at the latest. My social life is more directed by having great conversations about people that are trying to build other businesses, people that are inspired or passionate about things that they're doing. And it's not centered around the activity of drinking, which before collegiate years and, and shortly thereafter, like that's what the primary thing that we did and that was the primary thing we talked about. Now all the focus is more so on finding other people who relate to me in that way. So when you go out and you're you're with other people that are drinking, it, it can be very difficult, especially if some of those people are persistent in you drinking. At the core of the issue is that them guilt tripping you to drink is a reflection of them. It's just a projection. That's a personal issue that they're having. No one should have control over whether you drink or not. Anyone that you plan to go out with at any time where you're gonna be sober, they're gonna be drinking, I would try to take them aside one-to-one, -one, especially your close group of friends. You need to basically redefine the norms within that relationship. You do that by asking for genuine and sincere help. Tell them exactly what it is that you need. And especially if you anticipate getting dragged into situations where you're gonna have to take shots with people, you need to get those people individually on your side first before you're ever even in that environment. Because once you're in the environment and you're trying to say no and you haven't had that conversation, it's a lot more difficult if people are already inebriated. So by asking for specific help, it can look something like this. Hey, Jason, it's really important to me that I start this journey to sobriety for reasons X, Y, and Z. These are the reasons that are really important to me. Now, what I need your help with, you know, normally when you go to the bar and you're ordering beers or shots and you always get one for me, if you can not do that and get me a water and help me on this journey as well, is that something that you'd be willing to do? By getting ahead of it and telling them exactly what it is that you need, you give them the chance to be a true friend and supporter. The tough part about this is that you may need to find some new friends. You may have some people who don't want to help you with this. They may make fun of you. They may pressure you continually still, and that's just part of it. You still have to respect yourself. You still have to respect your decision, and it's up to you to be strong. Find other people who are on the path of self-betterment or at least have a growth mindset and are willing to help you in this. It, they can still be someone who drinks. It doesn't mean you have to surround yourself with people that don't drink. It doesn't mean that you don't have to go to bars anymore, but you do have to find people that will surround you and support you and care for you. So this is a combination of two questions, which are how much time, money, energy do you feel you've gotten back giving up booze? and what's been the positive impact on your life, and can you recap the learnings and benefits and how they've evolved over the two years. Everything in my life is better. My energy levels, my gains in the gym, my mood is consistently better. I used to have a much higher fluctuation of anxiety and depression. And I think sometimes we forget alcohol is a depressant. You know, in the moments that we use it, it feels good, it feels happy, but over the long term, it's doing some damage. From a monetary perspective, I would say conservatively over the past two years, I've saved somewhere between five and $10,000. And again, that's conservative. There were times where I went out and I would spend hundreds of dollars on alcohol per night. We would get tables at clubs. I would be buying people drinks. And you know when you get in that mode where you're not really making great decisions with your money because you're drunk, you end up spending more money on food and other things as well that you don't actually need. Time and energy wise, there's really no way to calculate this. Because again, it's never just the five, six hours that you go out in a night. It's the opportunity cost of everything else. The lack of productivity the next day. The money I would spend on hangover food. The weight gained from said food. And then the constant cycle of energy decrease because of that. And that speaks to this comment that I also got. When you talk about the mental health part, we use alcohol to relax, which causes us to neglect our responsibility and we actually don't get out of stress. We have this perception of alcohol giving us a stress relief, making us feel better, but ultimately for me, that was not the case. It was not making me feel better, and especially over the course of days, weeks, months, years, it was making me feel more depressed and worse about myself. At one point, it was like I had just accepted that all Sundays were a waste. I was gonna be hungover, I was gonna feel like shit. And when you get to a place where you accept that as the norm, it's really depressing. 
didn't even realize that you could be up at 6 or 7 a.m. on a Sunday and it wasn't because you took Molly and you just stayed up the whole night on Saturday. Which brings me to this comment that I also got and what he said was all the little lies I told myself about I was doing the fuck it attitude and that's so right because when you drink and you're in a constant state of haze. I mean, that's what I was in. I would convince myself that what I was doing was fun, it was great, it was it was a good time, and I was okay, but I, but I just really wasn't. Here's the last question, and it's, do you ever plan on drinking again? And if so, what occasion would it take? I don't think it would take an occasion. I think it would all be about where my mental space is at the time that I want to start over again. Because if it was about the occasion, I would have drank already. I've been through birthdays, celebrations, weddings. Doing these things all sober has made me understand like there's actually a choice. Like you don't have to drink just because you're at a wedding. Because there's so many reasons to drink, I think sticking with your commitment, not just for the sake of certain occasions, but just because that's what you feel in yourself and your intuition. I don't know if I'm gonna drink again. I might. Uh, it's, it's hard it's hard to say because if I feel any way that I feel now in the next five ten years then I won't if I have a change of heart and I want to have a drink here and there then I can see that being a part of my life one drink every once in a while and I would really have to be in the right headspace to, to start over again and then to want to keep doing that like I said in conjunction with this video I have an article that I'm gonna link below from the first year anniversary that I had without alcohol. That article details everything. It's how I quit, it's why I quit. It's a really great resource for anybody who's looking to cut back on their alcohol consumption. For anyone who has friends or family members that they wanna send this to who have been thinking about doing that as well. And feel free to comment on this video, share the video, ask questions. And if you're really struggling, get help. Until next time, keep wandering. You're not lost.